really, really hard, and they execute the system, and that's what it's all about. Yes, there sir. He trust. He's pretty big, big trust. trust. Big, big trust. trust. Hey, yes, sir. <laughs> right on cue. Hey, right on cue. Hey, I, let me go. We're back on another edition of the Jumbo Set Podcast, presented as always by Jamie's Famous Seafood. My name is Jake Luke, and I'm joined on my screen by Spencer Nathaniel Schultz. How are we doing, sir? You are on mute. Doing all right. Doing okay. Unmuted now. And been working on the golf swing a ton in, in my house here. Been recording myself, trying to get the swing down pat. That's been my kind of pastime through the, the unbusy hours during the day, if I have any time watching a ton of golf content lately and trying to see if I can get my swing a little better place. So fired up for that. The weather is pretty cold this week. We got fake spring last week. So riding that out and man, opening day around the corner. Free agency is kind of for the most part coming gone. The draft around the corner masters coming up here, March madness, obviously right about to kick off here. So one of the times of the sports year that is I feel like forgotten every year. Masters, draft, college basketball, all kind of rolling through. It's like not by me. It's it's my favorite. I'm well documented on that. This is my favorite sports time of the year. Well, I I absolutely understand. So fun time if you're just a overall sports degenerate to dip your toes into many different waters if you feel free to. So excited about that, and here we are. Here we are. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, fantastic time because like I always say, you can't lose during the NFL offseason unless, of, I mean, there's some bad contracts handed out, which we're going to get into. Sometimes maybe you don't like your draft picks very much. Uh, you could be a fan of the commanders or whoever it is, but I just like generally as a Ravens fan, it just feels like there aren't many losses taken throughout the offseason. I can certainly think of a few, but they're pretty few and far between. Uh, so yeah, that's great. Then you mentioned all the other sports, March Madness kicking off this week. Very excited Love to get together with the friends, just kind of, you know, belly up to a bar and watch those uh, opening salvo of games on Thursday or whenever it might be. So fantastic, fantastic time of the year. You're absolutely right. Uh, what else you got cooking on? You're practicing that golf swing. Make sure you don't do that in any low-lying ceiling rooms, by the way. I've made that mistake before. Got oh, I've, got, I've got the big vaulted ceiling over here. We're good. That's that's my, my walkway right when you walk in is my main area. And look at you. New studio set up. People might be wondering why it looks different. Well, that's because... You're now officially Jakey homeowner. Oh, yeah. There. So Big congratulations, time. Mazel Tov, and you're, you're in there ready to rock and roll. So I'm sure you'll deck that stew out as you keep going. Already got some of your accoutrement hung and framed and glassed up, and it looks great. So happy for you, pal. Yeah, thanks, man. It's been uh, been going pretty well. It, uh, it, it was definitely a process because we didn't do a truck or anything. So I was just kind of like hauling shit back and forth between Reicherstown and where I am now uh, in the Subaru and in the, the truck uh, to an extent. Uh, and then I was kind of trying to beat the clock there because I do my annual uh, OC trip for St. Patrick's Day. So I had a nice weekend down there. Got to play a little golf. Great weather. Fantastic time. Now we're back here. We're moving stuff in. There was definitely a couple moments where I felt like Michael Scott a little bit sitting in his uh, just wide open kitchen with no furniture, eating Subway, just saying like, you know what? I'm a homeowner. Like, this is fun. Uh, but yeah, you, you get through that and you get all your stuff moved in. I got the studio set up today. And uh, we're pretty much rocking and rolling. Uh, a couple touch-ups to make, some stuff still to add, but uh, we'll get to it in time. And we're, uh, you know, pretty much settled in and ready to uh, take in the the rest of the offseason here. So it's been good. High Top's newest VIP member. Big time. In fact, I talked about bellying up to the bar for uh, for the March Madness games. That's usually my bar of choice anyway, and now I'm a little bit closer to it. So, if, you know, if you want to swing through, I think I'm already – some plans are already germinating with me and some of the fellas to go uh, take in some of that action. At high tops. There you go. If you're you're in the county, head over to High Tops and see Jakey basketball and Mike Elias, uh, per many rumors. Hmm. That's quite interesting. I don't know how true they are, but I see a lot of inside jokes. <laughs> I don't I don't even know if should be talking about this, but I see a lot of inside jokes about him at uh, High Tops, and I I don't even really understand the uh, the origin of it, but they they give me a nice smile every time. So maybe I've I'll seen zero of that, so I have no idea. I've, it's I'm in the, it's in a sect of Orioles Twitter that I don't know if you're a huge fan of. Sometimes I love the the unhinged nature of it, and I, I get a kick out of that kind of stuff, even if I don't always agree with everything they have to say. Mike Elias headed to High Tops. Heard it here first. Uh, yeah, spring training. Right around the, I guess, the, I should say opening day right around the corner. So the other fellas dropping a podcast tonight, I think, talking about some of that. And then there are other happenstances. 
And then we're going to do an Orioles preview pod for flagship mm, this week. We might have to knock it out because, like, if my life wasn't fucking chaotic enough, I've got a cross country work trip uh, starting Sunday, just in the wee hours of the morning. Then I'm gonna hopefully, I mean, God willing, make it back in time for the tailgate. Cross country, wow! There you go. Ooh, yeah, going to La La Land. So, wow, another another big old flight for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a couple of them. You fucking move in, and then you're down at the beach, and then you're back, and then you're going across. You're fucking going across to L.A. for upper mid twenties, baby. There you go. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's fantastic. I, I couldn't recommend it enough. If you're in your early 20s, definitely continue to to grow up because it's it's just so much more fun from there on out. That certainly is. Speaking of upper to mid 20s, the Ravens signed someone who was formerly in their upper to mid 20s, 30 year old Arthur Mollett, to a two year deal here. I guess really the only big topic that we have, more or less, a couple. Jake, you said arrivals and departures as we squared off here, but Mollett signed to that two year deal, which is. Nice for a guy that was kind of it wasn't he was on the Steelers for a while, a little bit of a journeyman, someone who's been kind of a role player that it felt like really got to shine last year in Mike McDonald's defense. Had such a strong year in terms of being a disguise pressure off the slot. Gets really an elevated chance once our Darius Washington goes down and the Ravens also brought back. So the Ravens kind of shoring up those slot areas in their secondary. And hey, I mean, that should free up your boy Kyle Hamilton a little bit more. And Mullet really had a fantastic year, had some really sticky man coverage underneath, able to do some things on slot fades, things like that. Does tragically get burnt by Marquez Valdez Scanling in the AFC Championship game on a third down, which just was not, you know, you don't expect him to win that rep. I think it was and kind of honestly like, a, like he disrupted him enough that he had to fall down and kind of track the ball like Willie Mays and make that fucking miraculous catch. So tip your he, he, it there. was a fine rep considering he was matched up against the worst type of skill set that he could be matched up against. He is five foot nine, five foot ten, short, quick feet. Uh, Marquez Valdez scaling six foot three, six foot four can really just rip the roof off with his vertical speed. So to your point, made him have to kind of adjust and didn't make it as easy as maybe it could have been there. And it was, it was like a cover zero-ish type look, if I recall correctly. So, uh, you know, not really to your advantage as a DB unless, you know, the, the idea is that you want pressure to get home and to affect the throw, and it didn't do that. Patrick Mahomes typically roasts that. So something that maybe has been underrated and not talked about a ton is that call, and Patrick Mahomes always rips that apart. So that was a little wonky there. So Mollett back into the fold uh, here in Baltimore, and – you know, one of the, I mean, Patrick Queen crosses enemy lines. Mullet did it a year ago. So a little bit of uh, friendly bad blood there back and forth with Ravens and Steelers and all the intra AFC North movings that have happened over the last couple of years here. Yeah, you mentioned uh, some of the intermediate and deep third stuff that he did. I think a little bit about the blitzing, and I don't know how much of this is going to remain under or that it did uh, under McDonald. Obviously, you expect a lot of carry over there, but we'll see when it happens. But think about that Chargers game, what he kind of did to close that one out on. I think it was a it might have been a fourth down, or he forced him into a fourth and long that essentially closed that game out. A couple other uh, slot blitzes you can point to throughout the year. So just all around a really tenacious, scrappy player. He had a, a lot of attitude to him, which I like a lot. Uh, in a, in a cornerback room, and particularly for a guy like him, who you mentioned, little undersized, going to be playing out of that slot role a little bit. You like him to be handsy, you like to have him a little uh, attitude, uh, like he did in that Chiefs game. Uh, he was, you know, starting to fight with uh, some of those Chiefs players before I saw the clip going around. You know, obviously that game didn't turn out like we hoped, but uh, it's it's a good attitude to have in spots like that, and to have kind of that veteran guy who's not too old, he's not too young, he's got some years under his belt. And he's going to give you some quality reps. I think it's a great uh, signing. We don't have all the details yet, but two years I was actually shocked to see too. It's nice to kind of just have that guy stick and pick for the next two years and not really have to worry about uh, corner depth too much. It's definitely still a little bit of an issue, but to get another guy back in the room when they were seeing a lot of departures, to use that term again, uh, over the last couple of days, uh, we'll, we'll talk about a couple of them more as we move through here. Uh, just a, a, a nice thing, a good vibe signing. Yeah, and that's a good point. The more guys you had that were in that defense and got snaps, Mollett playing 458 snaps last year, which really started week four, 44 snaps against the Browns, and uh, that was kind of his season high. And playing, you know, 32 and 19 snaps in the playoffs against Kansas City and against Houston, respectively there. So, like you said, a little bring back somebody for cheap that was able to kind of stop the bleeding in that sense in terms of brain drain when – you are changing hands at the top of your defense from Mike McDonald to Zach Orr. So like that a lot. Uh, I guess that's all we have on Mallet. Kevin Zeitler signs a one-year six million up to six million dollar deal with the Detroit Lions. He will go replace Jonah Jackson, who got a pretty big deal there. So 
Zeitler able to go join the Dan Campbell biting kneecappers and get into another winning organization. I don't think really there's many two bad things to say about Zeitler. I don't think there's a lot of Ravens fans that have any ill to say of Zeitler, someone that came in, was a consummate veteran, and stabilized that right side a good bit in a tumultuous time following some uh, up in you know that 2020 season with Fluker and Powers and all this weird stuff going on in that right side of the line. Once Orlando Brown had to switch over, they go get Zeitler and he stabilizes things for a while. So uh, what we had heard is that Zeitler really wanted a contract last year. I don't think that no secret to us, but what was put out last summer by various media folk was that Zeitler wanted an extension, was pretty unhappy with the Ravens for not giving him one. Uh, the Ravens did have some void years attached to his deal, which accelerated. So the Ravens chose to kind of eat that today and let him go instead of extending him and prolonging that and uh, stringing it out a little bit more. So I think that does speak volumes. Again, we've talked how the Ravens do want to rebuild their offensive line and the Lions seem to want to just plug theirs up while the Ravens are looking for more of a makeover. So uh, hopefully Zeitler is able to go get a chance to go play in some more playoff football games and maybe go play in a Super Bowl or something like that with that Lions team. Yeah, and I'm not sure if we've chatted since the Moses trade happened either, but Morgan Moses getting moved to New York. I mean, you know, you move up in the fourth round for him. It's really just kind of a salary dump type deal. Uh, good to get, you know, further up in the fourth round, obviously. But overall, man, like we can call them liars all they want and talk about these liars luncheons and everything. Like they said they wanted to rebuild this offensive line. Well, they've got their work cut out for them because you're down three starters now and just a lot of question marks to replace these guys. Zeitler, I can kind of understand it. I mean, he's kind of getting up there in age a little bit dealing with some health stuff the last couple of years, obviously. And then, you know, the, the contract and everything, it seems like he left on overall pretty good terms. So it's okay. But yeah, you know, he's un unhappy about the contract and it's too bad that it had to end that way. But ultimately 34 years old, Moses was getting up into his mid thirties. Uh, and then John Simpson, obviously just kind of another odd man out there goes and signs with the jets. So like I said, man, work is completely cut out for them. You know, you're returning Tyler Linderbaum. Obviously that's great. Good on Ronnie Stanley for taking a pay cut. We haven't talked about that either on here yet um freed up i think around 10 million in cap space for them maybe a little bit more so that was an idea that you floated a while ago and that was bang on uh and very you know ronnie stanley he has a lot of cash in hand he's made a lot i think that was a a class move by him to allow them to uh to get some breathing room and hopefully uh put it to good use with this offensive line i mean i'm interested to see where they go with it floated the idea today just kind of sign a guard uh just to co compete with the guys that they have there right now and just sort of go all in on these offensive need positions in the draft, whether it's tackle or wide receiver. We'll see what happens there. Obviously, Beckham, Odell Beckham uh, posted that he will not be returning to Baltimore. Had a nice thank you message on Instagram there. So we'll see where he winds up. But I uh, still got some questions on defense, certainly with Jadavian Clowney floating out there, going on his uh, typical free agency tour that is not going to result in him signing anywhere anytime soon. I would assume he's not going to want to do camp. Didn't do it last year. He had arguably his best year, so that's fine. But uh, some uncertainties that, you know, outside linebacker, obviously a little bit of cornerback depth, but overall you really got your work cut out for you with this offensive line. I think it's a concern right now. I was feeling it a little bit after the Moses trade and then Zeitler leaving, but overall they said they wanted to rebuild it and, you know, they, they have followed through on step one of that plan. And step one is obviously always going to look more uncertain and feel a little more uncertain than that eventual step two, which is completing that rebuild. And uh, as I continue to say here, they've got their work cut out for them. So let's see what they do. Right, and we've seen Eric DaCosta be way more transparent than Ozzie Newsome in terms of what he says he's going to do or what he's concerned about. And then following up on that, we have seen him, you know, keep some tongue in cheek or you know give a little jab step so that he could fake the other way a couple times, but really has been transparent and have to expect because of that Moses move that there is something of prominence coming down the pipe at some point. There, what is, what is cracking you up here? Total non second. What do you think about Eric DaCosta's media relations thus far? Because it's been, uh, there's been some stuff. I mean, there's been the quite insulted comments about the wide receiver, and then he goes and fills those needs in the draft. That's really what I was thinking of in terms of, you know, him, him feigning a little bit. And <laughs> there was that. And then we've got the rebuild the offensive line. And then uh, there were reports out there flo <laughs> floated by a, a, a local radio host here about uh, potentially the Ravens inquiring about Debo Samuel, which he shot down with impunity, invoking one Theodore Seuss. Uh, I think that's Dr. Seuss's first name and the Lorax, uh, which was quite something. I thought that that was so intentional and it is Theodore Seuss. You're, you're absolutely right. But 
it was it was obviously so intentional directed at jason lock on fora goes on 1057 the fan all access whatever they call it Inside and access. says in there you go whatever it's called and no, says that, he's, he's our guy so true of course so says that you know oh the ravens are interested in debo samuel which at this point doesn't really make sense for the 49ers i mean I guess it could money wise. I think that Samuel has like a $22 million dead cap hit if traded before June after June 1st, I think it goes down into uh, like 6 million or something like that it kind of flips and his money gets guaranteed, which would then of course, you know, cost more or whatever, but DaCosta comes right out at Derek Henry's press conference too. wanted to really make a point out of that when asked, sometimes you feel like the Ravens do a little bit of inside state job where they might tell a certain reporter to ask a certain question so that they can, address something and really just shot that down so hard. And uh, what to, what we had heard through the grapevine is that, you know, Jason lock who obviously has a big presence from, I guess, just having Twitter really early and being a NFL insider for CBS at that time, you know, the, the late or late two thousands, early 2010s there has a huge following things like that. Uh, at one point felt a lot more, you know, sturdy, maybe was a good way to put it, but nonetheless, uh, I heard we heard that Bradley Bozeman, uh, Joe Linda's agency repped him Linda. a couple of years ago. Joe Linda's agency repped him a couple of years ago, and that the Ravens kind of figured out that there was a leak coming out of someone that they were talking to. And with like reporters and stuff, they do have close relationships and uh, things like that. The Ravens have gone a lot more national media route. It feels like the last few years, especially in terms of signings and scoops and things, they give it to like Rappaport, or Garofolo, or Pelicero. Josina Anderson has a lot. So it feels like maybe they kind of give information to get information perhaps in that regard a little bit in their, uh, their little finger snifflings towards some of these bigger deals and situations. Who knows? That's definitely speculative on my part, but my, I feel like that logic makes sense. Nonetheless, they felt that there was a leak at one point, and so they leaked that sounded like they kind of gave different people different pieces of information, one of which being that Bradley Bozeman, they offered a really big extension to, I think like a three-year – $36 million extension a few years ago, which was kind of before this guard boom has happened. And Bozeman ends up signing a one year, $6 million contract. I think 18 months later with the Panthers. And, and I think we had a theory too, which was before we even knew each other was the Zach or contract extension with it, which I think JLC was the one who reported that it was an extension and it wound up being a press conference for a retirement. So he kind of had egg on his face there a little bit. I think that's where this kind of beef between the two might have started. I, I don't know. I, I f maybe a little bit. I, I It's hard to say with that one without knowing because I feel like the word could have been, hey, guys, we're having a press. Uh, the media will get the heads up. Hey, we're having a press conference with Zach Orr. You're not going to know that he had a congenital neck disorder and is gonna it's a retirement press conference for a young player that's an all-pro. I mean, I feel like that could have been out of the woodwork. I feel like, and this is again speculation, but JLC definitely could have just said, "Oh, press conference for an upcoming free agent extension." Like, well, I think he deal. actually, like, and again, I'm not even like trying to, you know, tread on JLC too much here. I think he might have actually reported it, and like, I, yeah, that, that might have been where it's. I think that might per, have perhaps, been. perhaps, yeah. but definitely a strained relationship there. So it felt like DaCosta kind of stomping on the throat of someone whose access has obviously been limited to the Ravens where they cover in the city of Baltimore on that radio show and things like that. So uh, definitely DaCosta has a very, I feel like he has an enigma about him in ways. He's known as this big prankster. He also has had those moments of saying he's insulted about receivers, but then has been really forthright a lot of the time about what they want, the direction of the team, the moves they're going to make, that they do plan on re remaking the receiver room and things of that nature. So I think he stays um, like plugged in around the league too. I think he was kind of one of Ozzy's like, and he was obviously Ozzy's right-hand man. I think he was one of the guys who would work the phones a lot and like try to get inside information for him. Like one, speaking of 2016, weirdly enough, like in that draft, like he was one of, I, I, think, I don't know if I read this in an article somewhere or something, but I remember he told them like, hey, San Diego is taking Bosa. Cowboys are taking Zeke Elliott. I have this all in good authority. Like we're, we're just probably going to end up with Stanley here. And that's wound up being exactly what happened. And there might have been a few more instances of that that like got and out. Definitely of was a younger guy that came up with a lot of people. I mean, the Ravens have a, a gloried scouting department and front office and Ozzie Newsome and all the relationships they have and things of that nature. I mean, it's not like he, he was, you know, a Nepo baby that started on third base. He was one of the 2020 guys that started out as a cheaply paid young scout 
that you know played D three football and wanted to get into the football side of things. So flappies, uh, as they called them in Cleveland, exactly. Short so, for something else. I mean, those guys and the, the, those guys go to senior bowls. Those guys go to games. They see each other. They end up, you know, spending a lot more time on the road than with their families as they're coming up when they're young. So DaCosta, who still is a very young guy relative to his position in the NFL, uh, probably has tons and tons and tons of connections. But I, I recall that exact same thing you're talking about in that 2016 draft. Yeah, he he knew not. It wasn't a guess. They knew the order, and he was like, "All right, well then, here's our guy." So uh, certainly. So I think that. With that seasoning and with being able to watch Ozzy navigate and then put his own spin on it, he's been, in a, like I said, a little bit of an enigma. That's the word that comes to mind where it feels like you want to take him at face value sometimes. Other times he might be yanking the chain a little bit and, and, and you know, like I said, feigning a move. And then, uh, you know, this, this move was really just directly going at a specific reporter. So not something that we ever really saw in the Ozzy tenure and, Definitely set off uh, the the host of that show on uh, the old Twitter sphere there for a couple of days saying he's going to leak text messages and things like that. But I mean, it sounded like way, that would have been the, that would have been the greatest content of all time. It's too bad he didn't like really follow it up on that because like you know if you're going to like have this kind of beef and like and DeCosta was kind of the one who escalated in this instance. Like I kind of wanted to see JLC like pull the pull the fire hose out and aim it in his direction because it would have been like can you imagine that radio wars where he's actually like leaking real information. <laughs> I, I feel like that was his uh, probably his realization. I don't know what a, the Ravens, Chad Steele, the Ravens, they are very tight lipped. I, I always call them, you know, the, the Pentagon, the CIA. They run it is a state run organization almost with how clean and precise and detail oriented they are, especially in their media endeavors. So I would imagine that after JLC threatened to leak tech private text messages, at the end of the day, what is 1057? They cover the Ravens and the Orioles, Maryland basketball, football. Most of their, I would say the, the largest shareholder of their content is the Baltimore Ravens, who, like I just said, are like a state, they liken to a state run organization. So maybe threatening to leak private conversations was a realization of mortality for one Jason Lockham for us. So uh, it could be, but like everyone, everyone shits on them and they're, you know, as as Chuck points out, like they're they are number one, and like it, you know what, like sometimes it's good to have a, a media ombudsman in town to take you to task. Like if people shit on JLC, I've had my issues with some of this stuff, but like some of this like is really starting to entertain me. Like I, it's I highly entertaining for sure. It's it's like WWE esque almost in terms of what goes on in like a normal market. I feel like, and there's definitely zany markets too, but just hasn't been the modus operandi of Baltimore, especially lately. So yeah, it definitely is throwing in some flavor and some spice, but. Um, I don't know, man. The, the Ravens don't really mess around is the conclusion I've come to. Yeah, it doesn't seem like they uh, doesn't seem like they do anymore. In fact, like I remember uh, Alex Glaze with WBAL like last year, they were asking about in the pre-draft presser, they were asking about Lamar's contract and Chad Steele like ushered him out of the room. And that was very uncomfortable to watch. Like he literally said, stop, stop. And he like ushered him out of the room. That was like a big thing at the time. And then everyone just kind of forgot about it because a week later, Lamar Jackson signs a contract on draft day and it's, you know, then, you know, peaches and cream ever since then, but uh, it's tumultuous times there uh, the last couple of years, not over anything super serious, but, and that contract stuff got ugly and they were, uh, they were really trying to batten down the hatches during that as well. They definitely have uh, sealed the doors and laid down on those hatches. So yeah, interesting point there. And, I guess really of everything that's happened so far, the the two headliners of this offseason in terms of entertainment are probably Patrick Queen signing with the Steelers and that little spat over a Debo Samuel rumor. And again, if it came from someone else, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that would have it's been not that crazy of an idea. Like they they have a need at wide receiver. Debo Samuel like fits them to a T. Like but it, it's, it's not even it's not even that it could have made sense or not, but it's just it could have easily just been disregarded and nothing comes of it yeah no right if somebody else like if somebody else had put it out there he would have just said yeah no we we're not going to comment on that but he like that and really it's going back to the whole origin of this conversation even coming up it's that to cost of fired that specific shot across the bow and then the ensuing response all very just very entertaining stuff doesn't happen here in sleepy baltimore to your point very often so the, i mean the other the only is. other thing is uh jerry coleman complaining about the parking i mean that he read he read the orioles the riot act on that one and and Harbaugh like Harbaugh press conferences with Jerry, they had like a little fun relationship, and Jerry would get testy, and Harbaugh would like get a little testy, and then it turned into this kind of joking thing back and forth, and what have you. So, and the uh, Derrick Henry presser the other day, I think Jerry brought up uh, 
what do you say to people who think you're over the hill? And then Jerry, uh, the cost was like, well, people say that about you, don't they, Jerry? <laughs> a, lot, a lot of content coming out of that thing. I mean, gee, we didn't even really get to the Derrick Henry's comments, which were nice. Uh, you know, wearing the purple suit for his grandmother's funeral and everything. And it just worked out well. And sounds like this is where he wanted to be all along. So it's very nice. It does. So no thank you to uh, Miss Miss McCluskey down there, whatever her name is in Tennessee that – what what is the Titans owner's name? I'm blanking now. Amy know. Adams Strunk. Strunk, yeah. No, no, thank you. No special thank you to Amy Adams Strunk, who uh, was not interested in parting with one Derrick Henry at the. You're thinking trade of uh, deadline. Dexter McCluster. McCl- McCl- McCluster was it? Dexter McCl- Dexter McCluster. Fuck is what I always used to call him, but De- Dexter McCluster was his name. I don't know who I'm yeah. thinking of. McCluskey. There's there's a McCluskey somewhere in the the sports. I think it, that might be one of the Bears or something. McCaskies is the Bears. Uh, there's a McCluskey somewhere in the somewhere somewhere out there. I'll figure it out. But Robert nonetheless, Robert yeah. So state senator. There, yeah, yeah, yep. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. So, yeah, interesting. I don't know. I didn't really think of that altogether, but yeah, it's uh, definitely feels like a next wave of Baltimore media headed in, and the Baltimore banner emerging, things like that, and and. Definitely feels like this market has opened up to podcasters and things like that, like ourselves and uh, maybe the Ravens kind of severing a little bit of the relationship between some of those older heads there in that regard. So very, very interesting. Could be. What else we got on the docket here? I feel like, uh, you know, not, not a ton is happening. Debbie and Clowney meeting with the New York Jets, I believe, yeah. in the next two days or so. That's kind of one the one free agent that you look at, especially in terms of departures, so to speak, that you're like, I think the Ravens might like to have him back. And I'm curious. It felt right. It looked right. Had been linked for a long time. Interest had kind of been put forthright from the Ravens over the years. So we've, we've talked about all of that, but the Jets go out and uh, make a couple big moves. They sign Mike Williams. They get Tyron Smith and some additional reinforcements there offensively. And feels like, you know, the the former future vice president himself, Aaron Rodgers, you know, we'll see what he's able to conjure up coming off of that Achilles. And, uh, you know, him and Kirk Cousins, both older, older quarterbacks, uh, Aaron Rodgers, tech, it's not a new place, but it's not a place he's played games yet other than one snap of one or three snaps, whatever it was. One Was it the first snap? I think it was like the third. I think they handed it off a couple times and then run, uh, run, run, run Achilles, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I think it was like the third snap. So older quarterbacks and then we had a big there's a big spat going on i think it was bucky brooks maybe who is known to make those uh airwave rattlers saying that the quality of quarterback development and coaching around the nfl is down and that's why we see this carousel and things of that nature um you know these these older quarterbacks getting kind of rotated around and kirk cousins 35 coming off an achilles you know which to be fair was unfathomable 10 years ago, a 35 year old quarterback coming off of an Achilles signing a gigantic deal. So that I do agree has changed. Um, but it does feel like more so I, I don't want to put it on the development there. Well, it's interesting because he puts the development on the NFL coaches. I feel like it is the college game being watered down and the RPO bubble screen spread, you know, empty stuff that we see being very different from the NFL in many ways and not, you know, the, the lack of under center straight drop back offense with no play action, things like that. So I think it's a bigger jump while at the same time being a more quarterback centric league that is designed that way, right? The rule changes over the last 15 or so years. I have to like, I have to fully reject the premise of this. I don't know if Bucky, like Bucky has some of the most galaxy brain takes I've ever seen. Like, you know, the graduate Lamar Jackson, all that kind of stuff. Like, is he like taking some of these mind expanding agents with Aaron Rodgers in the dark room? Like he, like, this is so galaxy brain. I feel like quarterback play is like better than it's ever been. I want to do some research on this actually, because it just feels like guys come in and you're either ready to go right away or you're not. And like, I don't know. It feels like a lot of them, even like a Justin Fields, who obviously hasn't had a great career thus far. He wasn't in a great situation. He's got the athleticism to survive in this league. It wouldn't shock me if he played some games for the Steelers this year and he did well. Because like it is, it's more athleticism based. Things are a lot more wide open. The the rules favor quarterbacks a lot more. I don't know. Is it that much worse than it was 10 years ago? I feel like it's better personally. And like you're not gonna have a hundred percent hit rate. You're not gonna have 50% hit rate. You're probably not gonna you're not gonna have like an 80% hit rate on quarterbacks writ large. Like it's just it's too hard of a position to project. And things are friendly enough now, rules wise. I feel like Supporting cast and like we talk about the receiver bubble, 
and all that kind of stuff. I feel like it's all been pretty good for quarterbacks. And, you know, it gets to a situation where like a Jared Goff comes in. He looks OK right out of the gate. Then he has a or he doesn't look OK out of the gate. He looks pretty bad. Then he gets a good supporting cast, looks a little bit better, fades a little bit. Then he goes to Detroit, gets plugged into a, situa a good situation and starts playing pretty well overall for the Lions. And we'll see what happens with his future, obviously. But he's pretty entrenched there right now. So it's all situation dependent. And I just feel like situations league wide are getting a little bit better with these wide open offenses and with some of these younger, more forward thinking coaches that can relate to these quarterbacks a little bit better. I don't know. I just I, I can't agree with the premise at all. And I know Bucky's like a well-studied guy and he played and everything. So I don't want to totally, you know, discount his opinion or anything, but I just don't know where he's coming from on this. I feel like it's more quarterback friendly than it's ever been. I think it just looks at Justin Fields. And I think that situation has sparked so much. That's one thing we haven't talked about, I guess. Justin Fields getting traded to the Steelers for basically nothing, which a couple months ago was being widely reported that it was like a second rounder, or potentially a first, things like that. So I do feel like, the short shelf life or short window to succeed as a head coach or as a GM or as that combo does contribute to a lot of these young quarterbacks having tumultuous starts to their career. Go look at Baker, who in a similar vein, you know, you talk about golf start. Baker, also number one overall pick, comes in, rookie of the year, sets the end of the rookie touchdown pass record and has the Browns like competing for a playoff spot in year one, head coach change, offensive coordinator change, head coach change, offensive coordinator change, injury. Suddenly he's getting chewed up, spit out, and is worth nothing. Goes to a stable situation, follow, you know, unpresumably or unpresumptuously, I should say, follows up Tom Brady. Very little expectation there. A team that did have a winning culture in place because of that, that Tom Brady experience. And, and to me, what the ball a good offensive mind back. takes right off, signs a hundred million dollar deal. And to me, the volatility factor there is you mentioned Tom Brady. He came in in 2000 and you look at what happened 10, 11 years later. Something that people really don't talk enough about with this kind of stuff was the 2011 CBA, which completely changed rookie contracts. And if you're a quarterback coming in, you got three years to prove yourself. Literally, that's it. And they're going to throw you into the fire right away because it's like we got to know if we're going to pay this guy. We've got the fifth year option, but that's a lot of money. And then we got to know if we're going to pay him to be the highest paid quarterback in the league because that's just what happens every single time. If you're close enough, you're going to be the highest paid guy. So it really that has lent itself to this all or nothing nature. So I guess, yeah, to your point, you're right there. And I think overall supporting casts are good and they're set up to succeed very well. But if they don't, they're getting the hook very quickly because they don't have enough time and enough resources to commit into these guys if they're not going to be the guy. Right. I mean, Trevor Lawrence, widely regarded as the best quarterback prospect since Andrew Luck comes in. He's not consistent as a rookie. And it feels like the ability to sit a quarterback, to say that a quarterback doesn't need development is insane. They, they all do. Like even look at our, so many top picks. RG3 came in guns a blazing, took the league by storm, had everybody in the world watching the, the Washington, formerly R words at the time. So the volatility there is just nuts. I mean, even if you succeed, but you're, it, it's kind of a phony success in a way it's propped up on stilts or house of cards. It just feels like such a crap shoot and guys aren't afforded the ability to sit anymore. Guys aren't able to sit like Patrick Mahomes got to sit behind Alex Smith. That was the luxury, right? That the chiefs were a winning team that had a quarterback in place, got the guy that had the way better tools and he was able to yeah, by osmosis, soak it up a little bit, be in that stable situation. Very rare now. Very rare. I mean, Lamar Jackson, another one. He did get to sit. He did not have to go start week one. And I would imagine that the pressure of that probably relieved a little bit start, starting his first game a couple months into the year as opposed to week one. So not something that teams allow to happen, really. Justin and Fields you started very early, like all these guys. So... And it's polarizing in this situation because the Bears were in a really bad spot when they got him. And I think Big Cat has actually had some really good takes on this on Twitter the last couple of days where Justin Fields went into a really shitty situation. The Bears did not build around him properly. They didn't get him receiving core. They, I think they kind of tried to do the Lamar Jackson thing where it's like, all right, we're going to do the running thing. Then we're going to try to develop him. But they just didn't handle it correctly. Now he's gone and hopefully he'll you know do well in Pittsburgh for his own sake. I'm not rooting for him to do that well there necessarily. I'm sure you'll be, uh, you'll be cheering him on still. Um, but... Um, Big Cat is making the point that Caleb Williams is going to be walking into the best number one overall pick situation maybe ever because this was a you know a seven-win team this past year. They've got a lot of talent. 
They're going to be able to pick a stud receiver right behind him because they've got that next first round pick. Like he's going to be set or up a Joe Alt, who people think is like a plug and play. He's a freaking Notre Dame all all American left tackle. So, yeah, exactly. So yeah, exactly. whatever the situation is stable, their defense has been good. They have added to that defense as well. They were competitive. Like they're a seven win team, but they were you know fighting for a playoff spot kind of. So I think those all are great points, and it, it again shows that Ryan Poles it feels like made the decision not to build for the immediate around the rookie and was like, I'm going to swing again. This isn't my guy or whatever, what have you. So, um, you know, number one is a little different too. You've got your pick of the litter fields. Wasn't the first or second or third quarterback pick. He was a fourth quarterback pick in that draft. So uh, not really a similar situation at all. Yeah. Big cat made a great point there that they've been priming Caleb Williams for over a year. I mean, they traded for DJ Moore. They go get some other, you know, young offensive linemen. Then they go lunge and go grab Keenan Allen. And to your point, can go add a dynamic player offensively. And it will be one of the more talented, stable situations with veterans that we have seen a, a rookie top of the draft and especially number one overall quarterback come into. I mean, that's kind of like a death kiss being the number one overall quarter uh, pick as a quarterback. It means you are going to the a team that was so bad that, they objectively were unable to win games or like the Rams. yeah or like the rams when they traded up for golf and they just gave away all their assets and then they didn't have anything to build around them they're like all right let's just try to make it work with Tavon austin and ultimately what the what did help him was bringing in sean mcveigh so you've just got to like you've just got to have the right system in place overall and um yeah i don't know it's just it's an interesting discussion but like where i come back to bucky's overall take and if he's only referring to like the justin fields thing i get it but People bitch and like have these polarized discussions about Dak Prescott and Justin Herbert. If and you can make a like a pretty solid argument that those guys are like the eighth or tenth best quarterback in the league. If you drop them into the league 15 years ago, these guys would be looked at as like gods walking on the earth. Like the, this is just where I'm at with it. Like the, these guys are so physically talented now. You've just got to put them in the right spot to succeed. And I think ultimately Fields going to the Steelers will be good for him to do that if he can get in there uh behind Mr. Unlimited at some point. And I think Caleb Williams is gonna be set up pretty well too. So very good points there. Breaking news. The Ravens have signed former Raven, Chris Board. Special wow. teams eights. Chris Board. There's a name I haven't heard in a while. There you go. Was that one of Voss's guys that he was always like, they, they're they wasting $1 million on this guy? What else? Yeah, they, they they signed Chris Board to a like $2.5 million deal, and he was like, that is a million and a half dollars that could have gone to a pre premium player. So I mean, he's, you know, he's not technically wrong. He's not, a, he's, it's certainly not a yes or no, but it was uh, always an interesting conversation. Okay. Well, there's, there's a little linebacker depth for you and special teams ace, like you said. So there you go. Special teams ace. I was, I was uh, hoping, I mean, I'm going to be honest, nothing against Chris Board. I was hoping for a bigger name there, but it's okay. Also breaking news, Will Zalatoris and Sahith Fagala to team up for the Zurich Classic. I saw that earlier today. That is an all-time vibes group that right there. Love both of those guys. See, I'm a big Sahith beef. Oh, yeah. I love it. Sahith. Sahith Beef. Sahith is the pronunciation. Oh, all right, Jake. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I think that was a fun conversation and, and kind of segues into the draft here. Uh, it's a little bit of a strange draft class. I don't know if there's like a ton of defensive depth, so to speak, in this one. There's a hundred trillion million wide receivers and some good offensive linemen and all kinds of good stuff. So a couple premier tight ends towards the top there and things of that nature. So draft coming around the corner, we'll, we'll fire into that a little bit, but yeah, kind of makes you happy when you are one of the teams or fan bases you follow that has a Mahomes or an Allen or a Jackson or a Burrow or a, I don't know, I'll throw Jalen hurts in there. Quarterbacks that look the part, act the part, win and get you to the playoffs, right? It, it sure is a shit show right now. Not having a quarterback. I think is is a bigger way to look at it. It feels like, especially in this AFC, the quarterbacks are reigning terror over everything else, right? I mean, there's not teams that are sliding by without premier quarterback play. You have to have an MVP candidate at quarterback right now to be, you know, a, a pretty serious contender. And you, we talk about golf. Golf probably a guy that he got a smidgen of MVP consideration stuff, but. The Lions were stacked offensively. They have a five-star offensive line. They've got a Monroe, St. Brown, Sam Laporta. They've got two sturdy backs, you know, some, some nice ancillary receivers there too. 
Uh, Jamison Williams, a high pick. Josh Reynolds had a nice year. So if you don't have the quarterback, you have to kind of be perfect, especially offensively. You have to put them in a vacuum. So I guess that does ultimately make sense. And I, I was in favor of the Bears, you know, maybe keeping Justin Fields to, to round up that conversation. But, you know, I'm, I'm having the realization that wasn't the best idea, right? You, you can't take half measures towards your quarterback. And in terms of development, in terms of like people forget about the human nature of relationships and situations and work life flow and fields being there and feeling like, you know, they didn't really buy into me. They've had their, it's like the meme of the guy holding hands with one girl, looking the other way towards, you know, the draft and a potential other quarterback that sours guys. It sours their attitudes. You know, I, yeah, I look at Jerry Judy who was just traded to the Browns and gets extended. Like Jerry Judy has been in a fucking toxic situation for the last couple of years in Denver. Nonetheless, yeah. like a conducive to success offense with Drew Locke and then Teddy Bridgewater and then whatever the hell went on with Russell Wilson. So we forget the human element of that aspect and that, you know, it can, if you hate your job, if you hate the people you work for or don't like it or don't feel like they're appreciating, rewarding you, it tends to be tough. And some guys are able to kind of look past that and blow by it and be a superstar. And many, many, many more are not able to do that. Yeah, and you think about like some of the shit that he went through last year where the media is kind of going after him about some of his comments about like not being set up properly and maybe taking him out of context. And then like he's got to do that whole charade where he's going out in practice and like hugging Luke Getze and all that kind of shit. It's just like, man, like it, it was just kind of splintered at that point. Like you got to just kind of take your take your L there and not to turn this into a Bears podcast. But I think polls might have actually done him a real solid here because you, you got to think he could have gotten more than a six rounder, maybe not much more than like a fourth, but like he sent him to a good organization and he took him, you know, took a six round pick for it. I it, I think that kind of was a feather in the bear's cap for doing right by him after really not doing right by him to start his career out. Well, I mean, nonetheless, it's, if they're going to take a quarterback, they don't want fields hanging around. They don't want the cap hits hanging around. They, they do want to get him. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like, I don't really feel like it is a, a thank you to just, or a, Hey, we hope the best for you move for Justin Fields. I feel like it's, we want our guy, our number one pick, to be the shining prince and not feel like there's anyone breathing on his neck or, or you know, looking behind uh, to that other quarterback. So a clean slate there, and for, for the best. I mean, right? It, it's been, Justin Fields is like had to. They had like some weird press conference at some point. I think last year with like some some weird like Justin still our guy or whatever the hell happened. I can't fully remember. But how many uh, of those have happened in the, <laughs> in the last twenty years? I mean, look at the Josh Rosen, another one Josh, that comes to mind, Josh right? Our guy, yeah, we've had they had the golf thing where Les Need was like, "Is is Garrett your guy?" He's like, "Yeah, he's our guy right now for sure." Uh, Kyle Shanahan, you know, who knows if we'll be alive? Yeah, exactly. I don't. I can't guarantee that anyone in the world will be alive Sunday. That was uh, Trey Lance. Like, look at fucking Trey Lance's situation. If yeah. we're talking about highly drafted quarterbacks, so getting drafted at the top of the draft as a quarterback is not a easy path to success. And that's why, you know, you look at the, the Trevor Lawrence's of the world who did kind of will a pretty crappy organization that has felt kind of one foot out the door in Jacksonville, let alone being successful and in, in the playoffs into a spot where like, Oh, the Jags blew it down the stretch, missed the playoffs, but they haven't been in that position in a while. So I think that does speak volumes about how tough it is. And again, like just, Going through all the years goes to show how good Cam Newton was, right? And people were like, "Oh, is Cam Newton, dude?" Cam Newton's him. box score stats and stuff. Dude came into the league and was scoring five touchdowns a game. It was him that that one year, and then it was Andrew Luck the next year. And it's like, oh, you just get one of these quarterbacks and they'll figure it. Out. And it's just like you know, Andrew Luck got broken down by the Colts, and Cam Newton certainly over. He had some injuries, you know, toward the end of his tenure with the Panthers there, but he overcame as well. Uh, so yeah, look, you look, really look how talented Kyler Murray is, man. Look yeah. at the arm talent, the pedigree, freaking six A, five star Oklahoma. Could have played pro baseball because he's that hand eye coordinated and athletic as well. And was a le like midway through the season, what two years ago was like the odds on favorite for MVP at one point, and still can't really break through. Right, the card that he need, still can't get the Cardinals to the playoffs. You need an alien. You need an alien because guess what? Patrick Mahomes is Doctor Manhattan. And like nobody else can even come close to him. So it's like you got to get the close as close as you literally possibly can. And I think Lamar Jackson's right there. I think somebody Joe Burrow is certainly in that conversation. Josh Allen, I think Herbert talent wise is in that conversation. Yeah, Herbert is definitely an alien. He's six six. He can run 20 miles an hour. He can launch the ball. He he seems pretty crazy between the ears in terms of like shutting everyone else out. He's private. He seems really like he loves football. 
He's super emotional about football, but not about anything else. And, uh, you know, definitely I think is an alien. So, yeah. and you got point, the bounties throwing a, a dart at the board for, for Deshaun Watson, a pretty fucking pricey one. Deshaun Watson it, on the football field, definitely an alien stuff. He was doing the highlights of him getting pancaked on both sides, spinning out of it and then whipping the ball downfield or throwing, you know, running 50 yard touchdowns as a rookie, stuff like that. So, um, that now is what is so to sum it up. That is why the quarterbacks aren't being developed. They can't, they can't afford to be babied because if you spend three years doing that and still fail, then you get fired. And that's why you need these guys that have the strong arm that can play out of structure and can cover up for a lot of your other organizational mistakes, which a lot of these guys do. And now you've got the Vikings trading for a first round pick from the Texans. Texans get a nice recoup there. They can build around CJ Stroud a little bit. And the Vikings are going to move up and take JJ McCarthy. Like nothing against JJ McCarthy. He might be a solid pro, but he's going to be like a lot better than like Brock Purdy, who was glaringly not as good as Mahomes in that Super Bowl. And that's probably, in my opinion, why it swung the Chiefs' way. I don't know. 100%. So JJ McCarthy, that's going to be a point. I mean, yeah, to, to, to that very point, CJ Stroud, pick number two last year, came in and immediately was successful. So, you know, it's, it's not that it never happens and that one we breezed right over, but then you have the stark contrast of Bryce Young right there with a desolate Panthers organization. Who did the Panthers, three head coaches in three years versus the Texans going and grabbing a Shanahan guy and kind of clearing their house out, rebuilding and, and able to do it in a more professional manner. So, um, yeah, it's tough. And CJ Stroud was not, it, I would say 65 to 75% of people had Bryce Young as like a clean QB one of like respected draft analysts. Clearly the league kind of felt that way, um, you know, but hey, there were internal rumblings that we've talked about before that the Panthers, it was like Josh McCown and Frank Reich wanted CJ Stroud, but I don't know if CJ Stroud would have looked the way he did in Carolina with Tepper breathing down his neck. So all these things come in and, and quarterbacks have become so polarizing. Their talent has gotten so absurd. The shelf life or the, the expectant expected shelf life of a GM taking over a team that's picking in the top five naturally through their record. Those are all factors that mean you can't draft freaking the 13th, you know, you can't draft some kid and sit him behind Teddy Bridgewater or, uh, you know, a Jacoby Brissett or a, I don't know, like a, a, I think of like Colt McCoy back in the day, like that kind of bridge quarterback can't, it doesn't happen anymore. Teams can't survive. GMs can't survive. That's where it starts. And that's why there is that development development issue. There isn't right. development. You got to develop by the time week one rolls around or like week three. I think Baker sat two weeks. I think Herbert sat two weeks. So, I mean, Lamar, for all the talk about him getting to sit, I mean, it was half a season. Like, you sit for eight weeks, and then you get in there, and they build, they build an and offense. they talked about the how they were really working on his, like, footwork and mechanics throughout that time as well. Like, actually physically developing his tools during the regular season, not like, oh, shit, we've got to win on Sunday, or I'm getting fired. I mean, it did kind of get to that point for Harbaugh, but that's why they, they were rolled with him, and who knows? I mean, maybe Lamar could have come in and just ran for 120 yards a game and they could have turned the league on its head early in that 2018 season. But it did feel like getting to sit a while took some of that pressure off and, you know, got them into a, an OK spot to, to have Lamar come in when they needed him and then him to do his damn thing with a kind of mediocre team there. Yeah, definitely. And uh, very good defense. It a very good defense. Yeah. They, and Flacco actually played really well. Like it's easy to forget. He played well in that first month and then the wheels kind of came off and he got hurt. So, I mean, and which was a common theme and why they had to replace him ultimately. But yeah, it's uh, it's quite something, man. It's very interesting to watch. And I am very interested to see what happens with that Browns team. Cause you mentioned the trading for Judy, they extend him today. I tweeted my Ryan Gosling. Uh, there's a bubble. Jenga thing but overall like if you look at the numbers it's not that crazy of a contract for a guy who's that talented but he's just had a lot of injury issues and we'll see how that works out for them but they like as has been the case the last couple of years teams there it's in place what are they going to do with it you know they uh they really squeeze the uh squeeze the orange dry there uh this past season I think they did a really nice job given the uh the hand that they were dealt but overall, is this Deshaun Watson thing going to give them any return on investment? I'm not sure. And it, it's quite a big investment, so it's it's a high bar to clear anyway. Certainly is. I, I do, you know, think people are like, oh, Jerry Judy this. It's it's his fifth-year option plus like three years at like $15 million a year or something. Like Gabe Davis gets that kind of money. That's just it. Odell, uh, we, Mike Williams got $15 million on one year. That's what Odell got last year. So availability, all those kinds of things. But it, it is kind of crazy 
considering how many rookie receivers have been able in a, a position that's needed much less development, it feels like, is receiver in contrast to quarterback where you can have rookies come in and make an early impact. We saw the Ravens get it out of Zay Flowers week one against C.J. Stroud, who we were just talking about. So, um, man, I mean, it's a it's a quarterback receiver league at this point. I think that is the, the crux of all of it. And that's where all of the resources are being spent, the draft picks, the money. Who knows what Justin Jefferson's going to get? Probably more than, you know, all but seven quarterbacks or some shit like that. I could see him getting well beyond what Nick Bosa got, right? Like Justin Jefferson's probably going to get $37 million a year or something when it's all said and done. So By the Bengals? Yeah, coming out of the Kroger HQ Cincinnati freaking crap shoots there. After they trade T. Uh, T Higgins to the Ravens for a second round pick. After not picking up the phone on them. All of it's all of it's going to happen for sure. All of it. All of that happened. All of those are real things. A little bit of a uh, I saw Forrest girlfriend in uh, Bash and Robbins 32 flavors. And then somebody said that he passed out vibes there. Ferris, not Forrest. But, come on. I got to get that right. Do better. Be better. But I think that's all we got. Okay. Arthur Mollett, Chris Board. We'll see Jadevian Clowney, Kevin Zeitler to the Lions. Draft we, just, we are just getting started. This roster needs some work. It does. I think uh, Mike Clay, the guy who does ESPN's kind of fantasy football analytic stuff, like he he gives like a one to four or a zero to four score, considering like pre snaps, uh, where you were drafted, things like that. The Ravens' offensive line was like a like the sixteenth best unit in the NFL. Like McCarry is still here. They have guys that they drafted at the guards. I mean, it's like they already McCarry can play tackle fine. He's not Moses in ways. He isn't, you know, as big of a hulking guy, but he's been perfectly fine over the last couple of years. He has trouble with the Trey Hendricksons of the world, but you've got some internal options. They've got three guys they drafted to play guard. It's not the end of the world. If one of the guys that you draft in the third, fourth, sixth round plays guard for you and Veteran cuts still could possibly happen. And this, like we said, very deep offensive line draft. Which you yeah, you mentioned the phrase half measures. I think that's probably a good way of putting it for this offensive line last year. It, like they did, re they played very admirably, but they were platooning tackles a lot and everything. And obviously, some of the, uh, you know, the guard play. We love our guy, John Simpson, very much. It was a little volatile at the time. So it, it probably was time for reshuffling of the deck. And you're going to have to get creative with Lamar's contract the way that it is now. So overall, yeah, I'm, you know, not happy with the way things are but I, I trust that they have a plan they and they said that they you know we're going to do this so we've got to take them at face value and we'll see what happens got the draft coming up got a uh, a pick uh compensatory pick uh headed their way they moved up in the fourth round obviously so they'll have their options there so i, I definitely would like to see them get a vet maybe they could get a zeitler situation pop up again where a quality starter comes available and then get them without having to sacrifice a comp pick that would be nice so certainly would and the the ravens at this point have 30, 62, 93, 113, 135, 165, 218, 228, and 250. So two fourth rounders, two seventh rounders there. Uh, a lot of picks. A lot, a lot, a lot of picks. And I don't know. That makes sense. Them picking that many times makes sense. They've they've done it many times before. I feel like DaCosta has been able to go find early role players or guys that in years two, three, four can can really take on that heavy role player or starter level workload so they did they, another thing that i feel like they've been honest about that they covet their draft picks more after this lamar jackson contract and i don't think they're going to be looking to draft the patrick queens and the adafe always who do need that that d word we we're talking about development i feel like they're trying to take guys that they think can come in and play quickly at this point and and raise that floor a little bit instantly on this uh 2024 2025 ravens team absolutely all right. Well, if that's all you got, that is all I got. Sure. Should I, sir, should I get us out of here? Sure thing. Thank you guys, as always, for listening to the Jumbo Set. Be sure to tune in on Thursday for the X-52 flagship show as well. Like Spenny said, we're going to try to get out some more content this week uh, in the way of an Orioles uh, preview. Maybe we'll shoot for that on Friday. Uh, like I said, I'm traveling early next week. We're probably going to have to figure out a plan for the Jumbo Set, get that out maybe a little early as well. Uh, and then hopefully... See everybody out at the tailgoat on Thursday where we will be doing a live show setup. Thank you very much to Jimmy's for helping get us in the mix there, set all that up. It's going to be a blast. Oriole season right around the corner. Best sports time of the year, as we touched on. So 
All very exciting stuff. Thank you all for listening. Feel free to follow us on social media if you're not already uh, at XM52Podcast across the board. That's Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. I am at Jake Luke. That's L-O-U-Q-U-E. Spencer is at Ravens for Dummies. That is the number four in the middle there. Brian at Barstool Banks. Taylor at Taylor Smythe 10. Eric at E-D-I-T-T-I 22. Thanks again to Jimmy Seafood. Thank you to Black Eyed Susan Spices. Thank you to Fed Thrill. Thank you to everyone that is on board with us, and we will talk to you again very soon. See ya. Arrivederci. and they execute the system and that's what it's all about. Yes, there sir. Trust. He's pretty, big, big trust. trust. Big, big trust. trust hey, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, right sir. on cue. Hey, right on cue. Hey, I, let me